interrupting a rather informal format coming with PowerPoint. <laughs> so please indulge my academic side for just a moment. Um, Professor Riddle asked me to contextualize what we're talking about, and so I quickly just put a few ideas together based on my book that I hope will be helpful to our discussion. Uh, I study what we label cyber grassroots organizations. These are organizations that exist only in cyberspace. And in looking specifically at diaspora cyber grassroots organizations, we apply James Wilson's articulation of organizational benefits. So I think this, this framework may help us think a little bit about our topic this afternoon. So the organization benefits include material benefits, such as information, referrals, and some service delivery. Solidary benefits, which refer to that feeling of belonging that you get when you're in a community, and also purposive uh, benefits, which is the primary focus of what we're going to talk about. Purposive benefits are about trying to extend benefits beyond the organization or the community. So philanthropy, economic development, political development, these fall into purposive benefits. We added a fourth organization benefit when we were looking diaspora-specific organizations, and that was cultural identity benefit. Because cultural identity benefits are a very important type to diasporas. These are opportunities for members to engage with others, to explore, express, and negotiate their individual as well as their community identities. More broadly, of course, we know that the internet is a very important mobilizing tool. It facilitates the formation of shared identity that's necessary to collective action. It's a networking resource for assembling and communicating among individuals and groups. And it facilitates issue framing. How do we think about the issues and building confidence to actually engage in the real world? Um, so this slide represents the basic framework from my book. And I realized that today we're talking about many different types of media, not just the internet and certainly not just communities on the internet, but I thought it would provide a helpful context for our conversation. The targeted actors in our discussion are diasporas, whether in cyberspace or in their day-to-day -day physical world living. Diasporas are continuously engaged in negotiating and expressing their hybrid identities, this first uh, Part of the frame. Um, so they mix and they emphasize various aspects of their country of origin and also their country of residence identities. When we speak of engaging diasporas through media, it is this identity that we're actually targeting. So I want to be, I want to explicitly put that out there on the table that targeting diasporas is qualitatively different from targeting other kinds of audiences for what we want to have done. Arguably, without some form of social capital, which is the next goal, <laughs> um, and also some basic organizational benefits like the ones I enumerated, these diasporans would have neither the inclination nor the capability to mobilize for purposes of benefits beyond their community. Organizations seeking to foster mobilization for these kinds of purposes, uh, benefits would do well to also consider those precursors to that mobilization. Is the community already engaged in identity formation? Do they already have some degree of social capital? Are they experiencing from your organization or from their own these kinds of organizational benefits that would facilitate their collective action? And these are questions that every organization can ask uh, to confirm whether or not these things are happening. But also, these organizations, your organizations, may also consider how can we foster those precursors to purposive action. So the bottom part of the, of the slide here articulates the internet benefits specific to each one of those stages. They may or may not apply to your organization and its work because it depends on whether or not you're mobilizing on the internet or using different tools. But I thought this was a good starting place for us to think a little bit more holistically rather than just the, you know, the common lingo is how do we capitalize on diasporas without first considering who is our audience, what's driving them, what makes them interested and able to do what we're asking them to do. So without further ado, I am very excited that we get to learn from practitioners today, and I'd like to invite our panelists up to the table. Um, and somebody can take down the presentation. That would be great.
Okay, so now I'm going to switch to much less formal mode. <laughs> and so that you're not continuously hearing from me, I'm not as interesting, I would like to invite each one of our panelists in turn to introduce themselves. And perhaps you can start for us, Nita. Please, please use the mic. Yeah. Thank you. I guess you'll be able to hear me even if you can't see me sitting here. Um, can everyone hear that? Thank you. So my name is Nita Rosani, and I'm here from the United Nations in New York. I have the area that's called uh, the News and Content Branch, which typically for the UN means absolutely nothing to anybody outside the organization. Um, if I have colleagues here from uh, the UN uh, agencies in Washington, they'll know exactly what I mean. Uh, in actual fact, this means I'm responsible for UN radio. Yes, we do have a radio production arm. UN television, UN website, and UN webcasting, and UN online news. So that's the area that falls under me. And we put out a lot of information. And increasingly, of course, we do it through digital platforms. A lot of what we put out is important to diaspora communities. And uh, we're looking always for ways to basically leverage this and to increase access of people around the world because diasporas are everywhere. So I'm delighted to be here. Thank you so much, Mita. Nami. I'm Nami Riyad. I'm the founder and executive director of Coptic Orphans. And Coptic Orphans is a diaspora organization uh, firmly planted in both Egypt and the Coptic diaspora. Um, uh, the word orphans, of course, refers to fatherless children, so not orphanages, but children in their homes, and that's predominantly the work that we do in Egypt related to education. And uh, outside of Egypt, among the Coptic diaspora, um, uh, we find that the Copts, which uh, Coptic means uh, is a re reference to the uh, Christians of Egypt, and I might add that Egypt was a predominantly Christian country for about a thousand years, but now they're down to 10%. But the Copts living abroad are uh, very strongly connected to Egypt, very philanthropic, very um, well-educated. And of course, we find all of this out. We knew this, but now we have proof, thanks to the research and the study that uh, Jennifer and Liesl put together, uh, probably one of the largest surveys of uh, a diaspora was the Coptic diaspora, and now we have proof of what we're saying. So I'm pleased to be here, and I'm looking forward to the questions. Thank you so much, Nareen. George. Hi. Um, I'm George Lehner. Um, my day job is, is I'm an attorney here in Washington, and I practice law. But my other day job is that I am um, chair of the Fund for Peace. And if you uh, don't know the Fund for Peace, you may know our principal product, which is um, what was once called the Failed State Index, but has now been rebranded as the Fragile State Index. Um, but I also spend a lot of time with um, several other NGOs, including the International Women's Media Foundation, um, Mali Health Project, which works on the ground in Mali, and um, Refuge Point. So I have a, a fair amount of experience on the NGO side dealing with um, uh, particularly in countries where, from which uh, there are a number of people who now are part of the diaspora. Thank you, George Misa. Maza Abru, I came from Ethiopia. Um, I'm the uh, owner, founder, and uh, producer uh, of uh, one of the first private radio stations in Ethiopia. Uh, that's Shaddar 102.1. Uh, the Ethiopia has a history of uh, broadcasting for more than 80 years, and uh, it's only uh, eight years since we have um, private uh, broadcasting uh, uh, licenses. So uh, I look forward to your questions, and I'm happy to be here. Uh, I'm way past my bedtime. If I feel sleepy, you can uh, wake me up. So I'm um, still like, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, Maza. So that we have you while we're awake, maybe we'll start with you. <laughs> <laughs> so Maza, yes. as the director of the largest public radio station in Ethiopia, what are your plans to grow your listenership? And uh, is your listenership inclusive of diaspora? Do you have specific programming to some of the diaspora who have returned to Ethiopia? Mm. 
Uh, I have to correct you, it's not one of the uh, largest public uh, radio stations, it's a private radio station, uh, we transmit with uh, two, 2 kilowatts and uh, our uh, broadcast area is limited to the capital city within the radius of 250 kilometers, but uh, we uh, did that because we were uh, uh, online streaming since uh, 2010. And we have uh, the opportunity to reach uh, much of uh, Ethiopians uh, who have access to internet uh, locally and uh, at the same time uh, we've been able to reach uh, a lot of diaspora communities uh, in uh, the United States, uh, Britain and uh, other European countries and um, our uh, programs uh, we target the local community, but uh, at the same time, uh, I have to uh, see my notes to just give you, um, since we uh, went online streaming uh, in uh, 2010, uh, I'll give you statistics of uh, between August 21st, 2013 and uh, August 21st, 2014, we had 733, 362 hits which is 30% of this is in Ethiopia, 25% uh, in the United States, and 5% in Norway. This goes on to 166 countries. Uh, the browsers they use is Chrome, 41%, Firefox, 21%, uh, Internet Explorer, 18%. So uh, we have a, a, a reach uh, which is uh, growing every time, and uh, since we joined the, the, the uh, ODMAO uh, application, we have uh, more uh, listeners, and uh, sometimes, uh, I think it was in April when I came to Washington, uh, most of the taxi drivers uh, listen to Shed there, and uh, if they know me, I, I will have a free ride. So <laughs> I hope I have uh, answered your questions. Yes, thank you very much. One of the many benefits, I guess, of coming to Washington. Um, George, uh, I have a question for you. How do you think NGOs should be engaging with diasporas through the media? Um, well, it's an interesting question because um, when, when I began to sort of think about this, I thought, well, they were probably engaging a lot more than... Uh, I realize, but I think uh, after looking at it, I realize that they don't engage very much at all with the, the, the diaspora. Um, and so it really does raise the question, what should they be doing? I, I, maybe before, let me just talk a lot of some of the reasons why I don't think they engage, and that may help answer the question of what they could do. Um, and I'm really focused now on sort of U.S. And, and, and Western NGOs that are operating in principally in, in Africa and conflict-related countries. Um, you know, I think part of the reason is that it's um, the nature of NGOs. Uh, Cash-strapped, uh, like diaspora organizations, everything happens sort of immediately. Um, I think there aren't a lot of vehicles for them to understand how and what communities they can reach out to, and that's sort of an interesting thing that I've been hearing about today, some of the platforms in which to identify diaspora communities. Um, I think the ways that they can do so um, really begins with the NGO itself, and that is sort of to ask the primary question, and that is, uh, and it was a little bit what you talked about earlier on, what would we hope to get out of an engagement with a diaspora community? Um, is it um, awareness, simply awareness, here, here's what we do in this particular country, we want you to become aware of and an advocate for, that com uh, for our cause? Is it um, a recruitment tool um, to find people who may be able to relate better to I'm working in, say, Kenya, I'm working in the Congo, or I'm working in a particular country as an NGO, and I'd like to find some people who could um, maybe relate better by my staff? Is it a recruitment tool? Is it probably what most NGOs think of? Um, is this a source of financial contribution to me? And so, therefore, how do I sell myself to the diaspora community? Um, I think it really, before you can really answer the question, how should they relate to it, NGOs need to answer the question, what it is that they want to do when they relate to the diaspora community. And I think we can be interesting to hear a little bit from some of the diaspora communities about that. Because I think there is a lot of skepticism, actually, among diaspora communities when they get an outreach from an NGO. What do you, what do you want? Where, where do you, why are you contacting me? 
uh, and that skepticism is really natural. I, I also think it's because very often when more formal organizations try to engage with diasporas, they try to cut right to the far right of the graphic I presented without first thinking, how does this relate to the identity? Why should they care? Um, and so this may be one, one explanation. Clearly, Maza's example from the radio shows us that the diaspora are quite interested in, in what's going on in the country of origin. So it raises the question of how can we tap that in a meaningful way that is more perhaps collaborative and speaks to the shared motivations to help the country of origin. And I think there's one other motivation that could be brought by NGOs, and that is, do I want to engage the diaspora community in helping me as an NGO set an agenda? Um, and that's probably the, the least um, likely, but perhaps the most interesting challenge to uh, NGOs to sort of say, could we engage a diaspora in helping us think about what it is that we are doing in their country of origin? Wow, from weird lips to God's ears. <laughs> I think there's a lot of potential there. And uh, perhaps, Nita, you can tell us where, if the UN is tapping any of these kinds of ideas in terms of how to engage with the diaspora for these purposes. Well, as I started saying, I think the diaspora means so many things to so many people. And I think typically the diaspora we've been speaking about. Oh, sorry, it's right here. My apologies. Uh, the diaspora we've been talking about this uh, morning and afternoon. Uh, has been focused to some extent on the United States, but we've heard, of course, about other diasporas. And when it comes to the UN, of course, the main motive here is to get information out, to make information available to diasporas around the world, perhaps about what's happening back in their home country. And um, it just goes to show kind of how far we've come. Uh, about five years ago, I was in Nepal, and my family, my husband and son went to Everest, they went to base camp, and I said, you know, please try and keep in touch with me, and they said, well, after a while, we're not sure, because we'll lose cell phone contact, and when they got there, they said, no, no, hang on a minute, they called me, and they said, we are still able to call you, and sure enough, I mean, everything has changed, the world that we're living in has changed, so today you have 4G contact all the way up on Everest. I mean, it's a sad thing. I mean, it's, it's kind of a tragedy on the one hand, but on the other hand, it just shows how the world has been penetrated in different ways. Um, and what I'm trying to lead into is to talk about how people craving information around the world about their communities can access it so much more easily than before. Now, what is the UN doing? The UN is that veritable tower of Babel. Everything that we do is done in the six official languages. All documents are translated into six official languages. And in addition, of course, we do a lot of our spoken work in more than English and French. We do it in a lot of these languages. Now, UN radio is one part of this in terms of communicating the spoken word. Because for diasporas, it's really compelling to hear the spoken word. Um, and we do this in eight languages. It's only at the tip of the iceberg. I can tell you there's so much more we want to do. But again, funds. So what we're trying to do is to make common calls with partners around the world. And we have proprietary content that others don't have in many cases. So we can go live with access to information that perhaps others will not have. So whether it's somebody who's going into homes after the siege of homes was due to this area, such as the humanitarian coordinator, he speaks to us, we put it out on audio. Um, whether it's somebody in, uh, you know, DRC, uh, where, where you have basically um, the, you know, in the eastern part of DRC, when you had the fighting just last year, and the town was about to fall, we could bring that kind of information very quickly to our audiences. But not everything we do is about breaking news. I'm the first one to admit that we can't possibly compete with organizations out there which have so much more money. And it was fascinating to hear from David. I mean, he said, you know, they're a nonprofit and they don't have adequate funding. Well, believe me, we, ours is a drop in the ocean in comparison. But we still have special access to information. And that's what we're trying to leverage. Radio is one way, and we're delighted, of course, because we've developed a radio app, and I was trying to show it to colleagues. My phone wasn't working. We have uh, audio now. 
has it available, so you can access UN radio in any one of the six official languages from your mobile device. Um, in addition, of course, we're developing website platforms so that radio will be available through uh, internet connectivity, because that's a little less uh, the case so far. Um, that, that platform is not just audio, but it's also the stories that go with it, so there's an online platform. But I also want to talk about the fact that the diaspora really is increasingly craving visual content. And what we found is that web live streaming is kind of the direction that people are going in. So this is something that we're looking into much more. This was the first year when the General Assembly met, and it's still meeting, but the general debate took place. The New York Times embedded a live stream of the general debate. It was the first time, on, online that is, but not just the Times. Voice of America in Ukraine on their website, live streamed. Uh, Russia Today on their Spanish site, live streamed. India.com, which is of course a website that caters to the Indian diaspora, web streamed the Indian Prime Minister's uh, speech. The U.S. mission to the United Nations asked for us to help them live stream Obama's speech at the U.N. to all their embassies around the world so that the U.S. diaspora from the embassy group could also listen to their president at the United Nations. But guess which leader got the most hits in terms of the live stream content and, of course, it's on demand as well as live stream. Sorry, is there anybody guessing there? This is great. <laughs> You'll be surprised. No, not Obama. No, not Netanyahu, who was high up there. It was the Nepali Prime Minister. <laughs> because there are larger and larger numbers of Nepali diaspora communities, both in the U.S. and elsewhere in the world, who are so excited at being able to access this content, to watch their Prime Minister live and on demand. So I just want to say that we are looking for partnerships. Now we are engaged, as, as other speakers have mentioned, uh, in a terrible struggle to contain the Ebola virus in West Africa. Using radio, community radio, and other forms of radio to inform and to, to just put out news about what's happening, to correct the record, because there's a lot of inaccurate facts doing around it. I think we have to do it as part of a partnership. So this is where the UN will be looking to work with others and you know, to try and bring this information using our digital platforms. Radio, live streaming, as well as our online news site. So this is just a touch on a few things that we can do. Thank you, and uh, that's a good advertisement because uh, I suspect there may be people who would be eager to talk to you about some partnering around the Ebola virus. Um, Nermeen, I know that you have extensive experience, and I'm hoping that you can speak to us a little bit about how Coptic Orphans has used social media to engage with the diaspora, and if you have any tips or success stories that you can share to inspire others to do similar work. Uh, indeed, we are on Facebook, on Twitter, Instagram, um, uh, and if there's anything else out there, we're on it. Um, uh, but what's really interesting is what we found to really work is um, social media is really about identity. Every time that you like a page or you retweet, it's really proclaiming your identity. And so what better group to have to um, address this whole idea of identity other than diasporas? First generations are worried they will lose their identity. Second generations are trying to combine parents' expectations with the new culture and the norms of this, uh, the country that they're born in. And so social media becomes really uh, a perfect fit for um, kind of, we set out the, uh, the symbols, the keys that help people grasp onto their identity. Like for example, uh, we just had our 25th anniversary gala and His Holiness Pope Tawadros uh, attended and this was in Canada. So when we put out the video with his remarks, well we had likes from the United States, Canada, Australia, Egypt, uh, England, and it's almost as if to um, 
It's a shared experience of identity from the cops all over the world, the, uh, wherever that, that they're living. So this was one thing that uh, you really need to strike is the, the whole idea about identity. And of course, this identity is a uh, spectrum. You've got the very Egyptian and the very American, and then everybody kind of in between about e Egyptian Americans. Um, that's one thing. Um, the second thing, which is really, really important, is you must have also the human touch. Um, social media by itself uh, is not going to get you anywhere. You need to follow up. It's almost like the entrance, the springboard, uh, for more discussions and for the face-to-face. -face. And so we promote that there is uh, an event. We will be in Detroit. Anybody out in Detroit, we'd love to have coffee with you. And so you get, you know, hits back in, in response to that and, and provide that, uh, that human touch. Um, I think in the, um, uh, there's a lot more uh, that can be done, and as you said about the video, and we're actually going in that direction. Uh, a lot more visual uh, is needed, and we're going to be working uh, working on that. Um, and then just kind of to answer your question, well, what do diasporans want? We want to change our country. Why? Because we feel so um, indebted to the blessings of this country and the benefits we got from this country and feel that really deep sense of obligation towards, you know, our homeland. And so bottom line will continue until we change Egypt for the better. <laughs> Thank you. Um, if I might, I would like to ask a few more questions before we open it up to, uh, to the audience. And Rosa, I want to come back to you. Um, in your, clearly, you're reaching the diaspora, but I'm, just, I'm curious to know a little bit more about your programming. When you're reporting on local news in Addis Ababa and the rest of the country, do you have a sense that the diaspora is being engaged for any kind of direct action within Ethiopia? Usually, uh, the Ethiopian diaspora uh, is interested in um, history and um, a lot of political issues. Uh, other than that, whenever we put on a human interest story, I will give you an example. Uh, our reporter, one of our reporters, did this story on uh, one gentleman uh, because of his shoe size was uh, 48 or 49, I don't know. He had only one shoes. And um, uh, that he uh, has saved it for weddings and special occasions. And um, um, other than that, he was perfect. So we did this story. And um, the reaction that we got from the uh, United States and um, the place, places where uh, most of our uh, listeners are uh, was that some of them sent some money, and the others sent them some shoes, and um, it's only one local shoemaker who did uh, one shoe for him. So these kind of stories, uh, stories that touch the human heart, uh, the response is, um, you know, uh, tremendous, and, uh, and people really uh, show that uh, their support, and sometimes they send money, uh, and uh, you know, these are the examples that I can, I can give you. But other than that, um, s most of the Ethiopian diaspora, if we you know, started going out of the country in the 1970s during the revolution, some of them, unfortunately, haven't been back to Ethiopia. Uh, so uh, they want something which can uh, bring them nearer to their, uh, you know, to their country and to their families. We see this during the holiday seasons, and um, a lot of them call, and um, we, 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 we broadcast their uh, holiday wishes, and uh, uh, we do those sort of things. And uh, the other thing is that you know, the, the Ethiopian history is uh, of interest to them, and uh, political discussions, and uh, you know, what's happening in Ethiopia is interesting. So we, we do that. We don't do that particularly to cater for the Ethiopian diaspora. Uh, unfortunately, we have to uh, redo it. Uh, everyday programming, but it appears to them as well, so that's, that's fortunate. And uh, what we should do in the future is that we should 
uh, do some reporting uh, about the diaspora as well, which we don't do that often, uh, except that when there are, um, you know, uh, some uh, important uh, issues regarding the Ethiopian diaspora. So uh, we have to interest them as well. I think I find it very interesting that uh, we have two speakers from the diaspora who are really speaking to their direct experience uh, and really emphasizing these issues of identity and social capital and the human touch. Uh, and then we have two people who are speaking from organizations that might work more with diaspora to tap into what has been mobilized from the identity and the social capital. Mira, I wonder if you have any idea in terms of your listenership, how many of them act upon the information that you're disseminating. Do you have any idea? When I spoke earlier, I didn't really talk about social media platforms, but that you know the kind of engagement we're seeing is possibly the thin end of the wedge when it comes to interaction or action on some of the messaging that we're putting out. Um, and I use the word messaging not not in a propaganda kind of way, but in terms of providing information. I'll give an example to, to illustrate what I mean by this. Um, as you know, earlier this year there was very intense bombardment in Gaza for many, many, many weeks, and a lot of uh, conflicting information during the rounds, and media from both uh, Arab media as well as from the Israeli media really kind of contradicting each other, and very hard to trust the real truth uh, of what was happening on the ground. We found an intense amount of interest in UN news programs as a result, both radio and what we were putting out on social media and on our online news. There was one story when the first school was bombed and the outrage that it stirred, we saw 9,000 tweets from one story. That's kind of unheard of. It doesn't happen at the UN. We're not used to numbers like that. So we, were, <laughs> we were absolutely stunned by it, but it's the, the tweets were also uh, matched by a similar amount of engagement on other um, social media platforms, Facebook, uh, not just in English, but on the Arabic platforms as well. And it, you know, ideas of what people would like to see happen. Now, to what extent the diaspora acts on any of this, I'm not sure, except to say that there was probably pressure being put on the leaders. So that's, I think, the direction that it takes. I'll give you another example, which is also from earlier this year, and that's the situation in Ukraine. When the, when the fighting started in Ukraine, um, there was kind of very clear media lockdown uh, in the eastern part of Ukraine, as well as in most of Russia. And so people in those parts started turning to international news sources. And we saw an exponential increase in consumption of UN radio and UN news in Russia. Because they were obviously, and they were always finding ways, they were obviously looking for ways of, of getting some kind of um, authentic and verifiable sources of what's happening on the ground. Because radio stations were, of course, being jammed. Lots of things like that, what, you know, were happening. Uh, did that make a difference? I think the only thing that happened was uh, diasporas outside Russia were using this to then kind of raise the ante in terms of influencing their leaders to engage with Russia's leaders. So, I mean, I don't have anything verifiable, but this is the understanding. That's great, and it, it really implies that there's a great potential for partnership uh, between diaspora organizations and other service providers so that we can get the correct information and mobilize accordingly. And also it demonstrates that not every organization has to be responsible for each step in that, uh, that mobilization for some kind of purpose of benefits, right? Individual ones can contribute their specialization. Um, George, as an expert in fragile states, <laughs> I 
wonder if you could speak more to the role of diasporas in fragile states, because it's quite a complex one. Maza was talking about how politicized the Ethiopian diaspora is, and that's certainly true. And so when we think about diasporas that are so conflicted, um, it seems daunting to think about how might we mobilize them for constructive, peace-building kinds of purposes. Uh, uh, yeah, absolutely. It, it's a fascinating topic. Um, so start off just sort of anecdotally. Um, every year when we publish the Fragile States Index, um, within the first couple of weeks, there are umpteen number of calls from various organizations, groups, embassies, diaspora organizations and individuals who will complain about my particular country and how, could, how dare you uh, rank it here and, you know, it's right next to such and such a country and, you know, they're scum and we're wonderful and, uh, you know, so you have to deal with this. And but what it, even within that, what's interesting is, of course, you get from within one particular country, you may get very conflicting views. Um, you may hear, you know, why are we, why, why are we, you know, we shouldn't be um, viewed as such a, a good country or, or less fragile. I mean, it's ter you don't know what's going on over there. It's terrible. And yet somebody will call and say, you know, we should be, you know, really down at the bottom. It, it, it illustrates, I think, something that uh, many people have alluded to, but certainly I think it, it has to be bent more, more in mind when you're particularly working from the NGO side and thinking about engaging the diaspora community, particularly diaspora communities who recently have come from conflict-oriented places. They are incredibly diverse, not surprising. Um, they have a range of views, not surprising, and they are not often a community in some sense. There are many fractionalized communities, so you need to be remarkably sensitive in terms of engaging with those communities and often just the diversity of views, particularly being an outsider, means that it really isn't possible in some meaningful sense to engage with that community because you really can't judge what's really going on. So there's a, there's a real high, there's a real barrier, I think, in doing that. That being said, I mean, there are examples of, uh, and I'm aware of um, Public International Law Group, for example, which has done a lot of work in trying to get diaspora communities together um, in simulated peace-building conversations um, outside their countries, simulate the kind of discussions that you might hope would take place if you ever got to sort of a peace-building um, activity in the country itself, which can, I, I suspect, be very meaningful. I mean, I participated in a, in a mock of one of those once, and, and it was very instructive. I, I don't, you know, it was in, within a context of the countries that are still engaged in a lot, or a country that's still very much in conflict. But it did tell you, uh, and I think it informed some of the policymakers who participated in that, you know, just what are some of the underlying difficulties. So in that sense, that was a, a tremendous resource that might help predict where to, where to go. Um, I, think it's, I think the other thing that, um, again, the kind of sensitivity that's required when you try to engage a diaspora, particularly um, if you are working in peace building or conflict prevention activities is, um, again, you don't really know how that community, the diaspora community, is really being perceived back in the country. And then I think um, you alluded to this earlier on. I mean, you mentioned the Haitian community being sort of viewed as the sort of very middle class community. Um, I've certainly been in situations abroad where there is a high degree of skepticism about, you know, well, you, you got out, you're over there, um, even more so than sort of almost a Westerner um, outside the culture. You're, you're coming back here to tell us what? Um, and you have to really be very sensitive about that as well. So it, it's a very complicated but very interesting issue because I think we all believe that the African communities could be very, very beneficial in helping move some of those particularly peace-building issues along in their countries. Thank you. And you also imply that just as they could be constructive and helpful, they could also be interfering <laughs> when you have the conflict replicated in yeah, diaspora. Absolutely. So um, you talked a lot about the fragmentation of diasporas, the different views. And I mean, you spoke earlier about how you've experienced this kind of unification uh, with all that factionalization, that people really do come together in, in similarly liking some of your media output. But I've also heard you speak before about how differentiated your diaspora audience is. So can you speak a little bit to how you reach these different audiences, how you adapt your messaging? Uh, and, and that's always the struggle. Um, 
that's always a struggle. And uh, what we've been doing is really uh, listening to our people, our audience. And so uh, we look at every like, every share, every comment that we get on, on social media. So in terms of the, that, you know, social media. Uh, and then we do a lot of face-to-face, -to -face to, again, to hear what they have to say um, and, and to find the common ground for all the cops. It's really interesting. You know, we say, oh, you Australian cops are really different from the American cops uh, because, you know, and it's true, actually, they begin to become a, a little um, a little quirky, I think. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> yeah, you Americans. Um, so, um, but what's interesting, of course, is what unifies us is, first, the Coptic Church, uh, which, as Christians uh, and being of the Orthodox faith, we come to whatever land and we sit and wait until a church is formed. We can't go to the Catholic Church. We can't go to any other church. We're waiting for the creation of our own church. And so the first thing that any Coptic community will do is to create, you know, establish their church. Um, and so, and then when people come from abroad, where are they looking to move to wherever there's a church? Because that's very central into the community. And so it's uh, remarkable is that the church not only um, uh, theoretically or uh, conceptually pulls us together, but physically because we can actually meet each other often and, and discuss with each other. Of course, the challenge now is for the church itself. The church now has a diaspora for the first time in 2,000 years. So how will the church become will continue to be a Coptic Orthodox Church and at the same time become a universal church with adherence in hundreds and hundreds of, you know, or hundreds of countries uh, outside. And so uh, that's a challenge for us and a challenge for the church. And uh, we're actually working together in uh, putting ourselves together. Well, at this time, I'd love to open up the floor if there are any questions. Uh, I just want to have a question. So I know it's a little bit weird, but have a question as a person carrying the microphone, but <laughs> I just, I want to have a, a basic question. I mean, it seems like we have focused on what kind of information you are providing to the people in the diaspora community, right? But I just want to see the different direction and what kind of information they are most likely to listen or they are looking for, from, especially from radio stations. It can be uh, the political news of their own country or political news in the United States or entertainment news. Any other? Would you like to start? Well, they are interested in uh, uh, local, in the case of uh, Shaddai. Uh, Ethiopian news, what is going on in Ethiopia, because um, there is a huge political change and um, most of the diaspora, as I have uh, s said earlier, uh, has left the country and they've never been back, uh, especially those who are, who are interested in politics. Uh, really want to know what's going on in Ethiopia and they want to influence uh, the politics in the country, in Ethiopia as well, so uh, that uh, is their interest basically. If I am uh, entertainment, uh, since we have um, um, different generations of diaspora, unfortunately, uh, the young ones are much more interested in entertainment and um, something that they can uh, really relate to, to or they want to belong to what's happening in the country. So it's mostly entertainment, music, and uh, current affairs, current news of what's going on in the country. Uh, that's what interests the younger generation. Uh, the older generation is much more interested in uh, politics and they want to influence uh, the local politics as well. So, so do you hear from the diaspora requesting certain programs or content? Yeah, they do. Um, you know, it's very difficult when you are um, um, a station. Uh, it's a private radio station. Uh, we want to be objective. We want to be um, uh, credible. And uh, we want to see both sides. So uh, in that sense, it's very difficult because um, 
we are used to propaganda for uh, the, the European history of uh, broadcasting uh, is a lot of pro propaganda of the uh, regime which is in power so uh, when uh, we are trying to uh, do credible and objective uh, stories it's always difficult because you have either to side this one or the other one so um, usually um, whenever uh, um, we do, for example, a position story. Uh, those who are interested in politics would be would jump to it. But uh, whenever you do the uh, government side, they are not happy with it. So it's uh, uh, I can't say that uh, we satisfy uh, this or that, and uh, that's not our job. Uh, uh, so um, basically, uh, this is what. Uh, the landscape is, unfortunately. <laughs> Thank you, Nina. Um, and uh, Nina, what about for the UN? I mean, do you think that the diaspora, different diasporas are demanding different types of information? And do you differentiate, or do you just put out what you can put out based on the content? In other words, is it supply-driven or demand-driven? Unfortunately, I mean, I would love that it would be demand-driven, but that would Thank you. I keep forgetting this. I do have a loud voice, but not loud enough, perhaps. Um, uh, that would presuppose that we have a fairly good sense of our audience and that we can engage with them on a regular basis to mine exactly what it is that they, they are in search of. So I think when you become all things to all people, you tend not to have that luxury. So you, it is supply-driven more than anything. But... That being said, um, we have, for example, in some of the countries that are um, in conflict, uh, especially in countries where there are civil conflicts, I'll mention Syria, I'll mention Libya, I'll mention uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, wherever possible, what we're trying to do is to have a sense of what the diaspora from those countries are interested in, which most of the time is information about the latest developments. So that, I mean, in Libya, where you have rival parliaments, of course, you know, uh, we're not there to talk about the internal politics of the country, but what we can talk about is what the UN is trying to do there. So that when the Secretary General makes a surprise visit, as he did the other day, and he met with the parliament, etc., we can then uh, try to get that information out so that the Libyan diaspora, wherever they are in the world, would at least be aware to some extent, well, this is coming firsthand from their country. S similarly with Syria, it's a country with, where, of course, you have different armed factions in control of different parts of the country. Uh, there are a lot of humanitarian staff working for the UN and doing a lot of interesting work. And again, the diaspora sometimes are confined to refugees in neighboring countries but they're also, of course, all over the world. And they are just, um, they're thirsting for any information about what's happening in terms of uh, supply lines to Aleppo or supply lines, you know, to any one of those beleaguered communities. So, yes, we, we would like to be able to cater and to tailor, but I think what we're doing is just to get the information out and hopefully with that trying to cover as many bases as possible. Great, thank you. Are there any questions? The mic is coming around. <laughs> yeah, um, I was wondering if you've been talking about the, the spectrum of the generations and your interest, um, and I'm thinking, does that pose a particularly difficult business model, if you will, so that you have maybe an intense interest and, quote, market for the first generation people, and then what do you do to sort of try to get the second generation? You spoke to it a little bit in terms of the programming, but I'm just wondering about um, the affinity to the country of origin, and then if then over time it sort of dissipates. Mm -hmm. Can I ask you another Absolutely. Um, excellent question. Like this, right? 
Um, that's an excellent question, and that's what we're grappling with constantly. And yes, it does dissipate over generations. Um, second generation, third generation become more and more um, of the host country, less of the homeland. And so what we've started to do is um, we, put up, uh, we set up a program, it's called Serve to Learn. And the idea is for the young uh, second generation cops to go and serve in Egypt by doing what? Teaching English to the children there in, in, in Egypt. And really, I mean, I can get English teachers in Egypt, no problem. Why would I get them from the United States? No, you know, the, but the idea is to link them to their heritage and to their culture. And What's wonderful is leave it to little Egyptian kids to make him love uh, being an Egyptian and love Egypt and uh, really appreciating the culture. Um, and so these people, all these young people, come back more Egyptian than any of us kind of thing. And what's remarkable is I started to notice something. Um, and it just started, I mean, I started noticing it just this year because we've been doing this for about 10 years. Uh, the young people come back with a cross tattooed on their wrist. And this is kind of the symbol, the ultimate symbol of, I am a cop like you. I am united with you. I, your suffering is my suffering. Your fate is my fate. And so when we started to see this, I, I mean, that's really the proof that this program is really working. And we want to expand it uh, more and more. Um, and what's cute as well is that the youth are coming from America, Canada, Australia. And the poor Egyptian kids, they can't figure out the accents. You know, <laughs> it's almost like, if you could get your English straight first, then teach us. Um, but it's, uh, it does show the unity um, among the Copts. And uh, well, I think one of the reasons Nermeen was making eye contact with me is because I had the great privilege to visit one of the sites in Upper Egypt where Serve to Learn was being implemented. And one of the people who served that year is now on the staff of Coptic Orphans and is here in our audience. So I think that's further evidence that re-engaging uh, or engaging for the first time the, the next generation can get them committed for the long haul. Uh, so it's very exciting. Thank you. Other questions? I think. Where is it? Who has the mic? Uh, Fala. I'm going to ask you, uh, UN representative, do you have a specific aid plan for the North Korean defector who are in all over the world as a diaspora? Did you say eight plan? I didn't. I didn't fully. Eight, eight, eight plan. Eight uh, plan. For the North Korean people. Okay. Well, essentially, I mean, the UN does have a very small uh, program for North Korea. It's it's mostly the World Food Program, and uh, a little bit with UNICEF. And there are, you know, attempts to get more out there. But in terms of how these organizations engage with the diaspora, I'm not sure that there is that kind of targeted uh, in terms of, you know, fundraising, for example. Uh, I'm not sure that there's that kind of active engagement with the diaspora. So I don't know the answer to your question, but I think it's an interesting point. Uh, when you have to go into countries wherever the UN is present, it is always with the permission of the government. So. Um, getting the aid, the aid lines clear, clear and getting them approved and getting the aid in is already a huge accomplishment. Um, in terms of how the Korean diaspora could then feed in, I'm sure that UNICEF and other parts of the UN system are always open to funding. And UNICEF is, is the first of, um, among the many UN agencies that have taken donations from individuals. The UN used to have a policy of only accepting donations from organizations and member states. But UNICEF opened this up and it's all changed now. It's all up for grabs. So certainly the diaspora can, you know, make its presence felt financially. But beyond that, I'm not sure if they have any kind of system. Thank you. More questions in the front? 
Hi, my name is Terry Payne. I'm from IREX, uh, and I work in media development. And one of the things that I've been interested in, kind of linking the last question with the previous panel, what is your experience, if any, with diaspora actually being a, a, a source of funding for, say, your private radio station or your own radio? Or, and I wasn't sure with uh, your organization if that diaspora is a significant uh, element of your fundraising. And I work a lot with community radio stations, and I've tried to, for a long time, figure out how to link diaspora here with community, with small community stations in developing countries that might have an interest in helping to support, for example, their hometown radio. Masa, do you have any support from the diaspora? We are not allowed to get any kind of uh, support from uh, outside sources. Uh, it's it's um, illegal. <laughs> uh, but uh, as for IREX, uh, uh, we have benefited two times. One is in training and the other one is in uh, research. So uh, I think that's the only uh, support that we had so far. But uh, you can't get um, support from outside financial support. Of any sort. Okay. Thank you. Um, it's interesting you ask. Uh, we're practically fully funded by the diaspora, and uh, um, and they tell me well, there's a lot of money in Egypt. Why don't you seek that? No, nope, I'm not interested. I don't want your money. Why? Because I'm not interested. It's not about fundraising. It's about that connection between the diaspora and, and the country. And so uh, we, we refuse uh, Egyptian money from Egypt, but uh, fully funded uh, by the diaspora. Okay. Just to comment, I mean, I think that you know, funding from the diaspora is, is an interesting issue because it arises in a lot of different contexts. I mean, my sense is, and you know, somebody was talking about let's do the numbers. I don't know any numbers per se, but uh, just anecdotally, you're aware of when there's a disaster or some kind of tragedy in some particular country, the diaspora is often the first to respond, often very generous, it's often very easy for organizations not even associated with the diaspora that are working in those countries to go to the diaspora communities and raise a lot of money, and, and I suspect if you do the numbers, at least initially, a lot of the funding for those kinds of disaster responses come from the diaspora communities. Um, I think that brings a little bit of a skepticism that I was talking about earlier on, that the only time you go to the diaspora communities, if you're sort of a non-diaspora organization, is when there's some kind of tragedy. I don't think what's happened is sort of this, an opportunity to really step back and say, how do we engage the diaspora in sort of more long-term commitment to activities that we as a, a non-diaspora NGO might be engaged in and get there both... Uh, spiritual commitment, financial, and financial commitment to them, and that's something that I think we don't think enough about. Can I just add a thing that I'm really interested in? Particularly where community ratings are concerned in small and developing countries, it's really important to understand that there's a lot of money that's being spent on And I think just to pick up on that, I mean, this is those talks that somebody mentioned earlier on, and I think it's a really interesting point that um, diaspora communities, uh, and particularly local communities, are in, in many ways the very best connection for local communities and countries that we are, you know, not outside the capital city or that's it. And there are people there who can link to their relatives. And really almost working at that micro level, if you can identify that, can probably become a very, very strong connection. And it's a question of identifying how to do that. But I think that's item. That's a real place where people can think about how do you build those links because I mean, somebody earlier on mentioned how diasporans are, you know, are people in the diaspora community who came from a little village far away that really needs some attention. Thank you. did you have something to add? I just wanted to, I forgot to mention that uh, we are affiliates of the OA and uh, we had um, a lot of support, technical and um, professional support from the OA to uh, establish our radio station. So Doug is here. I just wanted to <laughs> add this one. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have a question? So, well, it's more of a comment and a bit of an insight, um, and I will kind of answer to your question as well with regards to um, community broadcast stations and um, how they, they could get that funding from, um, like, their uh, hometown um, uh, people. So, um, th for to that, I would say that uh, one of the 
big challenges I see is that first of all the diaspora like being scattered. Like uh, most of, of these communities would be scattered. And in one of the panels before uh, when we were discussing, uh, we did mention um, uh, it was discussed that we need a mechanism somehow to to have that connected. So it doesn't really even exist right now for the big stations or for um, main like um, private you know uh, corporations such as ours to do that. And one of the reasons, and I'm kind of segue into another element, is, is uh, one of the reasons why we wouldn't get funds from diaspora is because of the political uh, uh, polarity and uh, uh, I'd say volatility as well is reflected in the diaspora politically. So uh, if we start accepting money directly from diaspora members for us, it would... Um, it would endanger our uh, um, attempt to be uh, objective in our uh, media. And uh, it's a common concern because some of us have considered that, we've contemplated the solution, but we see what kind of pitfalls there would be in it. And um, also to talk about the political landscape, um, I know of some people that right now for the Haitian community are starting to think about having some sort of a transnational political party that would fight on both fronts, on the local front, and that's kind of what I wanted to add to, uh, to, to the panel. Mm, thank you. I'd also point out that as, as, and I forget which one of you said it, um, the number one thing diaspora populations want to do in this country is change back home. And if the broadcast outlets and other media outlets back home begin accepting money from those who want to change back home, they run the risk of putting themselves in serious trouble, as Mesa can attest. <laughs> Yes, well, the, these last two comments really uh, confirm the complexity of engaging with the diaspora. And, of course, one of the issues is that we so often speak about the diaspora when we, we know better than that, right? Um, George, you mentioned earlier the mobilization of funding when there's a disaster. And oftentimes what we see in that kind of mobilization is what I call the latent diaspora. Sometimes it's people who are already active and mobilized around their diaspora identity, but it can oftentimes also be people who don't every day live their diaspora identity, but when there is some tragedy in the country of Earth, and they mobilized. And we certainly saw that in the Afghan American community after September 11th, for example. So I had the opportunity some years ago to, a few years ago, to provide training within the State Department, and they wanted to learn more about what diasporas were and how to mobilize them. And so I kind of had this mantra that I kept repeating over and over again to don't mobilize the targeted but target the mobilized. And I think that's a really important thing to think about, but there are risks involved, right? So when you want to engage for purposes or uh, objectives, the diaspora, it's more efficient and effective if you mobilize with those who are already organized and share your mission. Then you know that you can walk together. Right? Um, instead, what we often do is, is target this amorphous thing, and then there's lots of misunderstanding because we don't really know each other. We don't have that starting point of common ground. But of course, often those who are mobilized are also politicized, and so there are risks involved. So thank you for those comments. We have another question over here. Who has the mic? Ah. Hi, um, do you monitor social media to see the kinds of conversations that diaspora communities are having, especially in the U.S., about issues back home? Um, I find it fascinating in two instances um, that I can bring up. Um, for example, in Nigeria, when the girls were abducted, if you follow the hashtag, you would see a lot of um, Nigerian Americans and African Americans from Africa who are joining from Africa talking about the issue and the insights that they provided to me 
and were so um, different from what I was getting in mainstream media. So um, I worked as a TV producer, so part of my job was monitoring social media. And another um, news story where I noticed that monitoring social media conversations added to the narrative was um, in the issue between the um, Haiti and the Dominican Republic and deportation of Haitians from the DR um, and not giving them citizenship. Um, I went online and went on Twitter mostly and I monitored hashtags to see what Dominican Americans were saying in the U.S. and Haitian Americans. And again, it was fascinating to see both of the communities interacting with each other disagree. And I find that to be an aspect that is often overlooked, that a lot of these conversations are happening online and we're not focusing on that. So I wanted to find out if any of your organizations do that. Thank you. Nita, can I ask you, um, now that you're coughing, um, I'm just curious because you, you were providing earlier some impressions of uh, the degree to which diasporans are listening and watching, so you must do some kind of monitoring, no? Uh, I would say that it, the monitoring that happens is, is anecdotal. I will be very honest because it's when you are catering to a worldwide audience and you're doing it on a language basis. You're not doing it on a diaspora ethnic identity basis. So when you're putting out Arabic radio, you're not catering to any one diaspora of Arabs. You're catering to a huge group. So unless there's a flashpoint which gets a certain conversation going, and then, of course, there will be an attempt to monitor that, uh, I don't think it's done on a regular, ongoing basis. But a particular incident or a particular situation might actually trigger that kind of monitoring. Thank you. And, and George, how about in your experience and with the organizations that are working in these fragile states, do you think any of them are monitoring social media to get a finger on the pulse of the diaspora and what impact they may have? Um, probably not extensively or systematically um, for a couple of reasons. One, I think it's as I said earlier on, it's time consuming and it can be um, resource intensive. Uh, but another reason is I think there's a, certainly a degree of skepticism about how representative social media really is about uh, the conversations that take place there and it can be very, very misleading if you're trying to particularly understand what's going on in, in conflict with um, regions because people who have access to social media, despite the fact that everybody has a cell phone and, you know, even just recently came back from the Congo and it is true that, you know, in places where you would never believe it, that everybody has a cell phone, um, everybody doesn't really know how to converse on social media. It's a very, I mean, that's a kind of this very sophisticated kind of skill in some sense. Um, it requires a, you know, literacy, it requires a lot of, you know, so you get a very mixed um, a very selective uh, audience who's, who's conversing on social media and you may really miss something. So uh, it's an interesting thing to do and I think, you know, particularly from a news perspective, people do it all the time and it can be very, it can show you some trends, but it, it may not be as informative as, as, as you would hope it might be. Um, I would also just like to add, as a researcher, that it's extremely beneficial to have friends in the diaspora who are on social media. Um, we share a dear friend who is uh, from Nigeria and Sierra Leone, and in the early days of the break, uh, outbreak of Ebola, he was posting multiple times every day on Facebook about what was happening in real time, and it gave me an opportunity to really follow what was happening there in ways that I never would have because it was not available in mainstream media. And, and that's, I think, the point. I mean, if you know your audience, I mean, if you're, your audience, and if you know your correspondent in that sense, I mean, it is an amazing resource. But if you're just sort of monitoring it in general, it's really, you know, I'm not sure who this person is. Yeah. But sometimes these individuals are, are um, they're, they're uh, compilers of other news sources. So the other news sources are credible. You just don't know where to look for them, right? And here you can go in one place to get that. And I think that's one of the huge benefits of, of social media. We have time for one more question, if there's another burning question from the audience. Well, I guess we've maxed out. <laughs> Perhaps anybody would like to call it quits so they can tweet about what a great panel it was. <laughs> Thank you all very much.